Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, for the program Norman Rockwell Inclusion, Exclusion, and Evolving Views on Race. My name is Jane O'Neill. I own the company Culturally Curious, and I specialize in art appreciation programs like this one. I have a background in art history and in education, and I have a master's degree in both. And one of the things that I found over the years is that people really respond to Norman Rockwell images. So I've been using them at, at essentially every job I've had over the past decade, whether I was teaching at the college level or working in an art museum or running a nonprofit, people really connect with this material. And so as I became more familiar with Norman Rockwell over the years, one of the things I became curious about was um, sort of his decisions to paint pictures of a very white America, and then ultimately arrive at very powerful political statements like what you see on the screen right now. We will be getting very deep into this image called the problem we all live with towards the end of tonight's program. But I wanted to start off with just a quick introduction to Norman Rockwell. He's probably the reason why you're here tonight tuning in. Everybody sort of knows him or knows his images. So just to get us all on the same page when it comes to this artist, I have his dates up here. He was born before the turn of the century and he died in the disco era. <laughs> Quite a long life and a very long and productive career. We can see him here in the image um, uh, staring out at us looking very serious, but we think of him as an artist with a great sense of humor a great personality. He is indeed America's most beloved illustrator. He was perfectly fine with that title too. He didn't sort of uh, have any qualms between the, the, the notion of being an illustrator versus being a fine art artist. He was creating commercial art on demand. He did have a fine arts training, a fine arts background, and he was creating oil paintings that would then be reproduced in magazine covers and calendars and that sort of thing. We know him best for his very long, almost 50 year um, long career with the Saturday Evening Post. And he produced more than 320 magazine covers for that publication alone. So, um, so the Saturday Evening Post and Norman Rockwell are sort of wrapped up into one of the same things. We'll be looking at that relationship uh, of, over the course of, of tonight's program. But I think when it comes to Norman Rockwell, we think of him as an artist who was able to conjure these images that helped to not only define, but really reflect American culture in the 20th century, particularly after World War II. So he was prolific, he was well-loved, and he's very closely tied to our notion of what is America. Um, he was uh, you know, a painter of uh, presidential portraits. He had a 60 year long career with the Boy Scouts of America. So he is sort of part and parcel with, with the definition of American life in the 20th century. So, um, so there's a lot more to say about him, but we're gonna dive in by looking at the images themselves. And I wanted to start off with this wonderful image that actually on its surface seems to have nothing to do with tonight's topic. This is an image of a jury room, and it's so much fun to look at this image. You might even find yourself sharing it with friends and family um, in, in the days ahead, because this is an image that you can slowly unpack. You can see the, the story unfolding with more and more details. You might notice the smoke hanging in the air. You might notice the, the crumpled ballots on the floor or the words jury room that are uh, in reverse because we are inside the jury room itself. We see the deliberations unfolding and we see that there is just one woman seated at this table. She is the holdout in this, in this uh, group of individuals who are tasked with deciding a defendant's fate. And, um, and she looks pretty firm in her decision. Her arms are folded and, um, and, and, and she doesn't look like she's being swayed by the various uh, arguments that are being presented to her. Now, the reason I wanted to start with this image is because it's not just an image about justice or the justice system. It's an image about social justice. Because when Norman Rockwell painted this picture in 1959, uh, this picture is called The Holdout, by the way, it it was, uh, it, it was at a time when women weren't allowed to serve on juries in every state across the country. So he's really showing here just the, the powerful contributions that women could make if they were considered equals in 
every part of society. So sometimes his suggestions of what is right and what is fair and what is moral are, um, are, are subtle and, and um, uh, require a little bit of unpacking. So let's turn our attention to the material for tonight. We're going to review just this notion of inclusion and exclusion because Norman Rockwell had this incredible capacity as an artist to create images that made us feel like we were all part of one shared group and also to paint these kind of um, exquisite scenes of loneliness and isolation. So we'll take a look at what that looks like and then how he applied that, that skill set to his work with the Saturday Evening Post. We'll turn our attention to um, also to the Saturday Evening Post particular policies when, uh, when it came to depicting uh, issues as, of race on their cover. And then we'll sort of work our way through Norman Rockwell and, and how he chose to engage with the subject of race throughout his career. All right, so a lot to cover here. Let's dive into inclusion and exclusion. Norman Rockwell, probably unlike any other artist I've seen, can paint these powerful moments where people either uh, seem uh, uh, in, uh, connected to others or completely isolated. And here we have just our, our faintest first suggestion of, of a person who seems uh, alone. We're going to circle back to this, this notion of loneliness in just a moment, but I wanted to start off with this, this idea of being included. And this was a powerful tool for the, the Saturday Evening Post itself. You wanted to create images that, that the American public at large could connect to. And so Norman Rockwell was painting images of the American middle class, particularly the white American middle class, because that was the, um, that was the audience for the Post. So in an image like this, where we see this, this called going and coming, we see a middle class white American family family on their way to the beach or the lake, um, going there and then coming home. This was painted in 1947 for the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. And there's always, you know, fun details to unpack here. On the way there, they are full of energy, enthusiasm, confidence. There's little jokes packed in here too. Somebody has stuck up the car over here, maybe some dog. Um, and uh, over here on the way back, the, the little girl who's blown bubbles is literally deflated. The father's hunched over, the mother's asleep, and then another joke from Norman Rockwell is that grandma's still in the back seat and she's unchanged. She's like the, the, the consistent figure in all of this. So we as Americans, we're supposed to look at images like this and laugh and connect with it. Maybe you feel just like that tired mom at the end of the day. Maybe you are the stalwart grandma. Maybe seeing these children reminds you childhood. Uh, and I think you're supposed to have a similar experience when you look at his Easter cover for the Saturday Evening Post from 1959. And what do we see here? We see the dutiful wife and her three children all dressed up, ready to kind of march off to church. And dad is sort of slinking down in his chair, trying to avoid any sort of responsibility there. He's acting as though they can't see him, but of course he He's sitting in a debris field of newspapers, right? And he even has a lit cigarette. So there's the smell in the air. There's there's the visual of the of the smoke here. We have his son who's kind of looking off to the side as though he wishes he could stay home. Norman Rockwell adds the wonderful detail here too of the dad with the messy hair having little double horns. So who among us has not tried to get out of some sort of family or social obligation? Um, well, the rest of your tribe is sort of heading off to, to something that they feel obligated to be at. Uh, this father is incredibly relatable, and we, we probably have all either experienced something similar to this or have had a family member do that as well. Norman Rockwell created other images that um, made us as Americans feel connected to him, feel connected to each other, feel connected to this greater kind of American experiment. And he did this particularly well in scenes of homecoming. This was the last Christmas cover that he had painted for the Saturday Evening Post. This is 1948. Notice how small Christmas actually factors into this image. There's the suggestion of a tree in the upper right. There's a few presents at the center. But this is really all about social connection and interaction and just that feeling of joy 
when you reconnect with a loved one who comes home for the holidays. In this case, he, um, he shows us that, that young man who's returning home from behind. We project ourselves into his body, really, and we are looking at the, the faces and the smiles of our loved ones. Or we are projecting ourselves into the body of his mother, who's uh, embracing him. Norman Rockwell always has a good joke for us. Notice the bag full of presumably dirty laundry that he has brought home for his, for presumably his mother to, to share. But these no, these experiences, the, the way we celebrate holidays, these are all about tapping into America's feeling of connectedness. This is what the American middle class is experiencing. We see that probably um, at it, its greatest iteration with Norman Rockwell's painting, Freedom from Want, from 1943. This is part of his Four Freedom series, but I think most Americans think of this as a depiction of Thanksgiving. I blame this image for all of our overeating at the holidays, because look at the size of the turkey. Look at all the food on the table. We have this notion that coming together is really all about the food. But what Norman Rockwell is telling us with this picture is that it's really all about the social connection. Everybody here who has just survived the Great Depression, they're not focused on the bird. They're focused on each other. Rockwell even includes this figure down below at the bottom right who's extending the table out to us. So he gives us images that make us feel like we're a part of the, um, the great experiences of the American middle class. He extends the table to us. Now, at the same time, Norman Rockwell has the ability to paint these figures that are in a sort of desperate isolation, a really sort of tragic isolation in some cases. This is a 1937 cover called Ticket Agent. And we see somebody whose sole responsibility in life is to sell tickets to people who are traveling all around the globe. And there are these posters all around him that seem to mock his status here behind the bars of this ticket counter. You know, are you bored? Travel. And this guy is stuck there. And once again, it's a very relatable image of isolation. I, I think everybody at some point has felt like they've been in a dead end job or been very bored at a job or longed for something great than they were experiencing in the moment. So even though there's a poignancy to this, there's a, there's a, a melancholy to it, it's something that truly resonates with everyone. He also has the ability to paint the experience of feeling alone in the crowd. And so with this image called Spears on a Train from 1962, we see how Norman Rockwell uses color to isolate this individual. We can see all, all the people who are ready for a ski vacation in their red sweaters and flannel shirts, and they are physically touching each other. They're, uh, they're reaching, they're leaning over, they're, they're clasping hands. And then we have this man in a black coat and gray gloves and a gray hat, and he is sitting with this uh, straight back, um, uh, un, uh, unconnected from everybody else in this space, uh, a fish out of water. And once again, it's a feeling that everybody has had. Norman Rockwell uh, paints it in, in such a, a wonderful and profound way that I think that it, when we look at it, we can all reconnect to that, that experience that we've had in, um, that, that elicited a similar experience. Another really powerful image of isolation is a girl looking downstairs at a Christmas party. This was a cover that he did for McCall's in 1964. Once again, he's using color here to heighten the difference between this girl and this very warm, chattering party down below. Uh, we probably all remember what it's like to crawl out of bed when you're a child and see what the adults are doing. And, what, and because Norman Rockwell paints this little girl from behind, we become her. We remember that experience and how um, and how you long to you know be older as a child. How you long to be a part of what you see as connection happening in, in, in the, the group of adults that you're looking at. I have a friend who's an event planner. She said, "Oh, this reminds me of being at every wedding I've ever attended. You know, I'm just standing there on the side watching everybody else enjoy themselves." So it's a universal feeling here too, and and even grown men that I've talked with talk about this picture is being very powerful to them. They feel like they're that little girl. So one last image of isolation that I wanted to share with you that I think also really heightens 
Norman Rockwell's or, or shows Norman Rockwell's particular skills around uh, around this issue is this image here called the soda jerk. It's uh, one of his sons who posed as the um, as the soda jerk in this case. This is from 1953. This is a really uh, wonderful, fascinating composition. We've got this sort of pyramid of the figures here at the end of the counter in in this uh, little shop here. But we also have so much white in this scene and just these little dabs of color, primary colors really between the yellow, the girl in yellow, the girl in blue, the girl in red. So there is some really intense eye contact and flirting that's happening here between these teenagers. But in order to keep it from being totally saccharine, Norman Rockwell adds in this uh, fifth character over here, a fifth wheel, a young man who is observing all of this interaction over here. And you can just sort of sense what he's thinking, like, why not me? Why am I not a part of this right now? When will it be my turn? So once again, Norman Rockwell is isolating a figure that is experiencing something that is universal. So he can make us all feel like we're a part of something. He can also highlight those experiences that are kind of devastatingly isolated. So how does he put those skills into service, particularly when it comes to issues of race and diversity in America? It seems like he's primed to tell the story of isolation in America. Well, <laughs> the Saturday Evening Post sort of has a different plan. We're looking at a Norman Rockwell cover here from 1941. It's a great image because we see it's a, it's a teenage girl complete with her dirty saddle shoes here who's reading her own issue of the Saturday Evening Post. And so we get this reminder here because the starlet on the cover is sort of standing, uh, standing in the place of the young girl that these magazines were, um, and magazines always have mass, mass produced culture is always about aspiration. And so the Saturday Evening Post, which had aspired from very early on to be a national publication, they, um, they wanted to create cover images that would immediately appeal, appeal to the masses in the blink of an eye, and then maybe include some further details that would uh, sort of pay off with careful looking. But one of their policies was to not depict people of color, specifically Black people, on the cover of the magazine unless they were in subservient positions. And this was really different from what was happening in um, publishing around the same time. So Time Magazine, Life Magazine, Newsweek, they were all focusing on um, uh, preeminent uh, African-American individuals or stories of race, but it's, it's a subject that the Saturday Evening Post completely sidestepped. And so Norman Rockwell talked about this policy and how it, how it impacted him. This is a quote from Rockwell that says, uh, George Horace Lorimer, the Saturday Evening Post editor, was a very liberal man, told me never to show colored people except as servants. He actually had um, what, uh, one of his figures painted out of his, um, what, one of his intended pictures for the Saturday Evening Post. So this was a pretty strict policy. And I want to give you a sense in terms of how it played out um, in terms of visuals. So I'm going to show you a few images of the way African-Americans were depicted on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post, but not by Norman Rockwell. These are done by other artists. This is uh, a cover from 1930 called Minstrels. So we're literally seeing white men in, in blackface performing a minstrel show here, um, which is of course this kind of performative issue related to race that certainly would never fly in, in um, in, in, uh, uh, on, on a magazine cover in today's society, but um, was acceptable at least to the editors of the Saturday Evening Post in the 1930s. Uh, in this uh, cover from just a few years later, 1934, uh, this was painted by an artist named J.C. Leindecker. He was like a mentor to Norman Rockwell in so many ways. This is called The End of a Vacation. And we see this beautiful, sort of elegant, slender white woman uh, who's holding flowers, sort of waving goodbye to her friends with, um, with her dog on, on a leash. And there's a man, a black man, who's behind her, at least from our perspective, and their bodies form this kind of V or like a chasm. And there is a chasm in terms of their status because you'll notice that he's carrying about five or six of her bags. He's, you know, he's, he's working for her and he is seemingly um, just there to increase her status on this cover. 
we see um, issues of race play out again um, on this cover from 1937. Again, these are not covers painted by Norman Rockwell, but they were painted by artists that he knew well. This gives us a, a good sense of, in terms of how this policy that the Saturday Evening Post had played out visually. In this 4th of July cover, we see two boys who have climbed a lamppost to watch a parade uh, uh, go by. And, and the white boy is sort of on, uh, on, on the street sign here. He's in this triumphant position, waving his hat. And the black boy is kind of hanging on for dear life, looking down below, looking scared. And so we get this sense of the social hierarchy being visually depicted right in front of us. The white boy has nice clothing, the black boy has torn clothing. Um, and, and, and we could go on at length probably about, about the differences depicted here, but, but the visual hierarchy is being reinforced. Um, another aspect of race relations that's reinforced again and again on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post by other artists is the racist stereotype of the Black Manny. And this plays out it, throughout the 1930s again and again with uh, this visual iconography of a plump Black woman um, wearing a headscarf, wearing an apron. Sometimes she's in service of white families. Sometimes she's working on her own house. Oftentimes she's wearing gingham too. And so occasionally these artists would use that same visual vocabulary to poke fun at white women. In this case, uh, this is a May cover. And if you have really good eyes down here on the pedestal, it says Queen of the May. She's not a beauty queen. In fact, she's she's wearing the visual code of someone who's considered just a servant or inferior. So um, this is a really unusual way to depict a white woman on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. Even when their house is in chaos and their kids are running wild, typically speaking, the Saturday Evening Post only published images of white women who looked like Donna Reed. They were tall, they were slender, they were beautiful, they were elegant, even if they faced in elegant circumstances. So I can't emphasize enough how often this black man type was reinforced again and again, reappeared again and again on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post right into the 1940s. And of course, it was being reinforced in other media as well with um, the 1939 movie Gone with the Wind. And when a culture is um, only really experiencing one facet of, um, of a group of people, that becomes reinforced. It becomes sort of set in concrete. We see this play out. Um, in recent years with the book and the movie The Help, we had some of you know, America's best black actresses in that movie. And Viola Davis actually said after the fact, I regret doing it because it didn't actually show the, um, the perspectives of the black maids. So, so this type, the black man type sort of continues on because it was repeated so much in popular culture. So let's turn our attention back to Rockwell and race and, and sort of see how, um, how he progressed along um, in terms of his understanding of race. The, this first image that I wanted to share with you is one of his earliest images, perhaps his earliest image of an African American. This was painted in 1926. This isn't a cover for the Saturday Evening Post. You'll never believe what this image was painted for. It's actually an advertisement for floor varnish. <laughs> Make perfect sense, right? So the story starts to unfold, right? We have an older black man, um, seemingly like an itinerant musician. He's got uh, this sort of torn, tattered clothes. He's come into the nice sort of elegant home of this white family and this little boy who's wearing a, a tie in his own house, they've moved the rug back, revealing these beautifully varnished floors, so that the little boy can kind of beat out a rhythm as this man plays banjo with him. Now, there's a whole sort of coded racist history related to depictions of African Americans playing banjos. This goes back to um, the 1800s and the pro proliferation of Courier and Ives Prince and, um, and really sort of like I said, stereotypical and derogatory images, but it's something that was repeated in mass culture uh, extensively throughout the 19th century and 
really up through the 20th century. It's why we see black faced minstrelsy. This is um, an image of a black faced minstrel from 1890. And so Norman Rockwell is really kind of responding to this visual history that already existed. Um, and it's not necessarily the way that he continues to perceive, but we see this is really how it gets started. It's um, it's a beautifully rendered, sensitively rendered depiction of this man. Uh, we see, you know, the individual characteristics of his face. I don't feel like he's he's relying on on a stereotype in in that way. But just the idea that it's a poor man that's playing the the banjo means that he's really kind of um, he hasn't yet really um, pulled away from the stereotypes that already existed. Now, what we'll see with these next two images is that, uh, for the most part, in his early relationship with the Saturday Evening Post, Norman Rockwell was abiding by this rule, only show African Americans in subservient positions. In this picture over here on the left called He Went That Way from 1934, we can see this elegant white woman who has fallen off her horse. And in order to add insult to injury, it's a, a poor black child that is pointing in the direction that her horse went in. Notice, you know, the major class disparities here. She's wearing this um, uh, this riding suit, and he is barefoot. Even like the dog seems to be cowering at this woman. We only see the child from behind. Over here on the right, in an image from 1940 called the Full Treatment, we see um, again sort of a plump middle class man in a business suit, presumably, but he's at a spa or a barber shop. He's smoking his cigar. He's happy as can be. He's getting a face massage. Um, they're working on his fingernails, and we notice that it's a um, a young black man who is polishing his shoes. Interestingly enough, Norman Rockwell included the detail that this young man's shoes, his own shoes, are, um, are threadbare. They have holes in the soles here. So let's see what happens as Norman Rockwell's views begin to evolve. There's a real shift in his approach to this work. Norman Rockwell said, I was born a white Protestant with some prejudices, which I'm continuously trying to eradicate. So I think, you know, to use the language of our times, Norman Rockwell aspired to be or wanted to be or was an anti-racist, so much so that he actually estranged himself from his own brother, who he felt was too prejudiced. So he was working to uh, sort of eradicate racist beliefs um, from, his, uh, from his thinking. And so he began to pursue artistic commissions that would allow him to, de to uh, depict a more diverse section of America, of the American public. And the way he did this was by working with publications other than the Saturday Evening Post. So um, what we're looking at here is an illustration that he did for a story in American Magazine from 1936. I won't get too deep into the story. It's called Love Wanga. It's about like a, a voodoo spell uh, that a uh, a woman from the city, a well-to-do woman from the city came to the country to sort of uh, find. But this is like a fish out of water scene where we're supposed to see that this, this more elegantly dressed woman is in this country church and she doesn't quite fit in. Everybody's got their eyes on her. Um, and in this case, I, I mean, uh, once again, you can see that Norman Rockwell is not relying on stereotypes. He is painting seemingly very specific people and painting a, a narrative in this case that that people can sort of decode the longer they spend with this. So this was from 1936. He works again with um, American Magazine in May 1940 to paint this picture called The Proud Possessor, another instance with a story um, with a diverse cast of characters. And in this story, um, essentially it's about a, a white boy who has these two dogs that he can't keep. And so he's asking the black boy to take care of the dogs and the black boy is kind of saying, what are you going to do for me? Now, what does this all mean? Why does it all matter? Well, Norman Rockwell um, was so committed to painting people, to painting you know, actual Americans, diverse Americans, that he had to seek out um, models to help him create these images. He had at this time moved to Arlington, Vermont, um, which was, you know, Vermont's like one of the whitest states in, in the country that was back then as well. So here he is committed to painting African Americans and he has to find models to work with because photography was um, was essential to his process. He couldn't paint a picture without photographic models and then working 
from those models. So here are the models for the proud possessors. I think um, on pedestals right outside of the Sonoma Rockwell's house. So this brings us to the mid 1940s and the uh, before freedom series. I, I think this is the series that most people probably best know um, uh, Norman Rockwell for. So he painted these four posters over the course of seven months. He labored over them. He lost 15 pounds in the process of it. It was really stressful to him. He, he very much wanted to encapsulate these four freedoms that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt espoused during his 1941 State of the Union speech. But I mean, it's tough. How do you depict freedom from fear? If somebody were to hand you a pencil right now and say, draw um, freedom, freedom of religion, what would that look like for you? So this was a struggle for, for Rockwell. But in the end, these were, of course, considered iconic and they were incredibly successful. They were part of a touring exhibition that helped to raise $132 million for the US Treasury during World War II. If that's not the most patriotic thing you've ever heard, I don't know what it is. So um, as you look at these four images, and we see that Norman Rockwell is doing his, his sort of typical uh, shtick here. I mean, he's trying to tell stories with each one of these four freedoms. As you look at them, if I said one of these pictures doesn't belong, <laughs> could you guess which one it is? If you guessed freedom of religion, you are right. <laughs> he had a completely different idea for this picture and race was integral to this picture for, for Norman Rockwell. He thought the Saturday Evening Post will still publish this freedom of religion, even if I include people of different skin tones. So what he tried to do initially um, before he arrived at this solution of these kind of uh, large heads and hands and prayers. And, and you'll notice there are people with different skin tones here, they're sort of on the margins. But what he tried to do initially was to tell a story, to, um, to have a narrative. And ultimately he scraps it. This is just a sketch for that story of freedom of religion. But um, the story here was going to be all these people of different faiths gathering together, socializing, enjoying each other at a barber shop. So we've got a Catholic priest, maybe a Protestant over here, and this was supposed to be a Jewish man who's getting shaved. Um, I, I think Norman Rockwell felt like he was relying too heavily on stereotypes, which is why he abandoned this concept. But notice that um, coming in the door is an African-American man. He's cut off, but um, but it was important for Norman Rockwell to include him. So ultimately, he abandons the, that idea. He goes for this kind of monochromatic um, large head format, which is so different from the other three paintings. But it's him trying to put his foot in the door with, uh, with the Saturday Evening Post in terms of this policy on race. We see him um, pushing against that policy again with this beloved image called Homecoming from 1945. So World War II is coming to a close. We see a young soldier who has come home um, to the sort of tenement apartment where he lives. And we see his overjoyed family spilling out of the back door to welcome him. Uh, we also see nearly a dozen other figures who are overjoyed by his presence, including his sweetheart sort of hiding around the corner. But you'll notice that there are blue stars in all of the windows here. The blue stars representing the fact that they have a family member who's fighting in the war. So when one comes home, it's a community-wide celebration. Everybody's happy that's, that this person has come home. Norman Rockwell chose to depict this in sort of a rundown neighborhood. He could have put it in a white suburban middle-class neighborhood with white picket fences, but he wanted to show a close-knit community. He went to Troy, New York, and, um, and specifically documented the, the neighborhoods there. And in Troy, New York, he saw integrated neighborhoods, and it was important to him to include that in this picture here, too. You'll notice that he even put the Black child up above the white child in this tree. So he's, oh, less than a decade later, he is, um, He's inverting that relationship, that hierarchy that the Saturday Evening Post had sort of glorified on the cover of that, um, of that July 4th issue. Now, I have a bit of a tangent here, but this is related to Norman Rockwell and his, um, his understanding of race and his interest in race in America. This was a story that hit very close to him because he was living in Vermont, and this was a story that was taking place at the University of Vermont. The story of Crystal Malone. She was one of, I think, maybe two or three Black students at the entire university. And in 1946, she was invited to join an all-white sorority. 
Um, the, soror the national organization of that sorority said that they could not allow a black woman in, and it became a national story. Here is Crystal Malone being featured in Life magazine. And so people from all over the country began to write to the president of the University of Vermont, um, expressing their opinion as to whether or not the sorority should be integrated. And Norman Rockwell himself put pen to paper and wrote a letter to the University of Vermont and said, let those girls integrate the, the sorority. I mean, think of the last time you wrote a letter to somebody who was in, a, in the position to make a, a, a decision. And Norman Rockwell thought this was important enough to do that. Incidentally, they did not let her integrate. And it wasn't until 2008 that that sorority actually apologized to Crystal Malone about the whole thing. So, um, so that same year, uh, 1946, Norman Rockwell's already thinking about race, he's feeling pretty passionate about race. He's given the most important assignment at the Saturday Evening Post of that year, and that was to paint the 4th of July cover of the Post. This is right on the heels of the end of World War II. Everybody's feeling patriotic, everybody's feeling celebratory, and Norman Rockwell's task is to paint the Statue of Liberty. Now, the Statue of Liberty was uh, depicted all the time on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post, and it was usually a pretty straightforward depiction like what we see over here. This is not by Norman Rockwell, incidentally, on the left. So Norman Rockwell is thinking, I need a new approach. I want to tell a story. One of his initial sketches shows that he's got a group of people, presumably a diverse group of people, standing at the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty looking up at her. And, um, and he scraps this idea, but he's still thinking about storytelling. And so he gets in touch with the organization that runs the statue and says, do you have pictures of people cleaning the Statue of Liberty? They said, no, we don't even do that, but we do have people that clean the torch. We can send you some photos of that. And so Norman Rockwell comes up with a very revolutionary way to depict the Statue of Liberty. In fact, he almost cuts her completely out of the Sure. All we see are really the most important parts that the, the crown, the arm raised above her head, and the torch. The torch is heavy leaded amber glass and does get occasional clean. That torch is also about 300 feet off the ground. So, in order to show just how indigenous it is, he puts a few of the birds in up against this blue sky. And he shows us five figures that are cleaning that torch. Now, this is it's a brilliant it, sort of compositional decision on his part because. The torch is about leading the way. It's about freedom leading the way. And this was America's new role in the United States. Now, the, um, the White House Historical Society already owned this picture. But about 10 years ago, a researcher got in touch and said, uh, you know, did you notice that one of the figures who is uh, cleaning that torch is an African-American? And somehow nobody had ever really noticed it or talked about it, not even the editors of Saturday Evening Post. Uh, in fact, the, um, the, the president of the Norman Rockwell Museum actually sort of zeroed in on this figure and said, wow, he shouldn't be there. Like that was against the rules. And so when the White House realized that Norman Rockwell was really making a statement about civil rights and equality, they reinstalled this picture in the Oval Office right above the bust of Martin Luther King Jr. So they really recognized that Norman Rockwell was doing um, something progressive there. But like for many people who are trying to eradicate themselves of prejudices, um, Norman Rockwell's trajectory was not always a straight line. I think of this as a really complicated image. It's painted the same year, 1946, and it's called Boy in a Dining Car. And we see one of his sons as the model here who is ordering um, off of the menu inside of a train. And he's got his little coin purse ready to pay for things. And we see a black porter who is looking down, waiting for the order. I read that the expression on his face as a very complicated expression. Um, Perhaps I'm just pro projecting my own feelings here, but I don't think that there are a lot of adults that love to take orders from children. So I think that this is a complicated, it, it's a complicated image and it's also it, involved with kind of a complicated history because black porters on Pullman trains were, um, it, it was considered a great job. You can make great money off of tips. It, it, beca because there were black porters on these trains, uh, it helped to establish the black middle class. 
Um, but while they were working on these trains, they were at the bottom of the social hierarchy. They were taking care of white families' kids. So it was, uh, it was a complicated role, to say the least. I think Norman Rockwell's depiction of that relationship is ambiguous um, and certainly not as um, coded to that hierarchy as, as some of his predecessors had suggested with other depictions of, um, of Black adult men serving white children. So let's turn our attention now to Rockwell and a new stance where we know he's coming out with a, with a new way of understanding race in America. And all of this sort of comes to a head for Norman Rockwell when he moves from uh, Vermont very suddenly in 1953 to Stockbridge, Massachusetts, so that his wife could, um, to, could get access to better mental health. And this is Norman Rockwell incidentally painting his famous picture of, of Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Now what happens there during this time is that Norman Rockwell also begins to receive treatment for depression. And one of the things that he's really struggling with in the middle of the 1950s is the idea that he wants to create artwork that has significance, artwork that has meaning. And, um, and I think sort of buried deep, he understands that that is related to race in America. He continues to produce covers for the Saturday Evening Post that sort of push that boundary. This is a, an image called Roadblock, where we have the, the bulldog that has stopped the traffic in this narrow alleyway here. This is such a fun image. There's you know all these people leaning out of their windows, um, exasperated, looking at this dog, pointing at this dog, inviting us into the picture. And notice right here, here at the front, Norman Rockwell has once again added the figures of African American children. Although we see them from behind, to him, it was important for them to be there. They're not playing a subservient role; they're part of they're part of the narrative. Now, what happens towards the end of the 1950s and early 1960s is that Norman Rockwell is essentially crowned. He's uh, coronated as this really important artist for this, the Saturday Evening Post. Here on this 1960 cover um, featuring his famous triple self-portrait, we have America's best loved artist finally tells his own story. The Saturday Evening Post realized that he was kind of getting ready to leave. He's sick of the work that they were asking him to do. He was really sick of this policy. Um, and so the, it, it was really in the early years of the 1960s that he, he makes his final stand. He does this with, um, with this image here called the Golden Rule from 1961. Seems really apolitical, doesn't it? Just treat other people the way you would like them to be treated. He goes out of his way to, to paint um, the most diverse cross section of, of the population he can. He's living in Western Massachusetts. Think of the I think of the models he had to kind of track down in order to create an image like this. And he has that coded word. He wasn't a religious man, I should say either. But he um, but he he noticed that this core concept was true for virtually all faiths. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The golden rule. And believe it or not, there were still a lot of people that looked at this image and they were upset by it because in America, for many people at this time, they still believe that you do unto others that look like you. So shortly thereafter, Norman Rockwell leaves the Saturday Evening Post. He says, for 47 years, I portrayed the best of all possible worlds, grandfathers, puppy dogs, things like that. That kind of stuff is dead now. And I think it's about time. He is ready to do that, that important work that he had been um, sort of grappling with right when he moved to Stockbridge. So he leaves the Saturday Evening Post. He sends in $500 for a lifetime membership to the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And he begins sort of a whole new life in art. And it was actually his counselor who suggested that he get interested in the story of young Ruby Bridges down in New Orleans. And that is really the start of the, stor of the story of this painting, The Problem We All Live With, which was painted from 1963 to 1964. So what we're looking at here, of course, is a young girl, I believe she was six years old at the time, who named Ruby Bridges, who was integrating a white school in New Orleans. And in order to do so, she was escorted in and out of the school by US Marshals. 
Um, this is, of course, a true story. This is Ruby Bridges here with those U.S. Marshals. Um, we're going to be talking about this image, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of historical context here. As Ruby Bridges was going in and out of school, there was a, an angry mob that she would met with every single day that was um, fighting to save segregation. Um, they actually paraded around a baby in a coffin, threatening her life. Um, her grandparents were kicked off of their land as sharecroppers. Her father lost her job, his job, I should say, and hit her mother, the grocery store stopped selling food to her mother. Her, for uh, Ruby Bridges to integrate the school was an act of courage beyond, I think, most people's uh, imagination. And it was um, it was something that threatened her livelihood and her, her, her threatened her life and her whole family's life as well. So this image had had a huge impact. We can see from this letter, uh, and I should mention this was an image that was in Look Magazine, not in the Saturday Evening Post, but somebody wrote to Look Magazine and said, I've never written to a national figure before, nor do I intend to make a habit of it now. Allow me to say that I've never been so deeply moved by any picture as by your painting in the current issue of Look Magazine. Thank you for showing this white southerner how ridiculous he looks. The truth is pretty hard to take until we get it from the Norman Rockwell. So certainly using his status as the painter of American life to now focus on this issue of race in America, in America gave him um, the ability to, to sway, sway hearts and minds. Um, in terms of how he painted this work, he had three models and uh, notice how he photographs them with the boards underneath their feet so they look like they're actually in motion. And he ultimately just kind of combines them into one form. And we and he's kind of playing with the composition, you can see in this work over here, um, knowing that this was going to be featured inside the magazine, look magazine, and that there would be a gutter down the center. And in this early draft, he puts Ruby Bridges sort of further back, um, hanging back with um, with the tomato juice kind of running down the wall in front of her. Ultimately, he decides to make her, uh, to depict her as, as eager and courageous, moving forward, um, ready to get her education as she was with that splash of red, um, which of course I think signals to all of our brains, blood, not tomatoes necessarily, just behind her. And so we get the sense that maybe it was a near miss, maybe that Maybe it was thrown before she, she started walking, maybe it was thrown afterwards. And of course, behind her is um, the racial epithet. We also see KKK over here. The heads of the marshals are missing. They are marching in lockstep. It's this innocent child that we are asked to focus on and, um, and, and consider in this picture. I wanna share with you the fact that this painting on the 50th anniversary of the integration of Southern schools, traveled around and it was actually exhibited just outside the Oval Office at the White House. And so here we see America's first Black president considering Norman Rockwell's work. And he's standing here with Ruby Bridges. And he turns to her, you can like look up this, this moment on YouTube. He turns to her and he says, I wouldn't be here if you hadn't been there. Such a powerful moment. And, you know, of so, so much consequence, especially because Rockwell captured it in a way that really changed minds. But I want to loop back, big picture, to this idea of inclusion and exclusion. Take us back to the little girl looking down at her parents' Christmas party, how he used color here to accentuate her difference, um, or her other status here. And he does the same thing with Ruby Bridges to heighten just how isolated and alone she is in, in this moment. This is kind of a, a warm tone background, um, but then we also have the, the grays of the suits over here. She is in this kind of pristine white dress and her skin is so stark and dark uh, against it. She stands out in this picture and Norman Rockwell is asking us, each of each audience member, to project themselves into her into her position in the same way that we saw with this little girl. So he continues on with this kind of social justice mission that he is on at this point. He becomes really galvanized by the story of, um, of three, three men who were um, working in, uh, in the deep south in Mississippi to try and register people to vote. There was um, a, an angry mob that was led by uh, a sheriff that tracked them down and, and murdered them. 
And so Norman Rockwell was committed to depicting this for Look Magazine. This is one of his early iterations here that he ultimately abandons. He takes out the mob, he just leaves the shadows. This is a sort of a grayscale composition that he created um, before the final work, but his editors at Look Magazine said, this is powerful, let's keep this. Norman Rockwell was so committed to getting this story right visually. He has the models in his studio. He even got a special dispensation from the hospital to get real human blood to see what it would look like on a shirt. This is Norman Rockwell and him wearing the white shirt here. So he he was committed to telling these stories as powerfully as he could. He illustrated a number of um, articles for Look Magazine, including this one from 1965 that's, that's called How Goes the War on Poverty, written by Sergeant Shriver. And you can see he is sort of using that same approach to, um, to depicting a, a diverse cross-section here in the background, as we saw with the Golden Rule, really. But his next great work depicting kind of the social cultural revolutions of the 1960s is The New Kids on the Block from 1967. I think that this is such a smart and wonderful picture in so many ways. It seems so simple at first glance, right? We see a, a Black family that's moving into presumably a white neighborhood. Their possessions are coming off of the edge of the moving truck here. Some of the, you know, their furniture is on the front lawn and they are being confronted by white children from the neighborhood. So it's sort of two against three over here. And you can read so much into poses. Who's leaning forward? Who's leaning backward? Then you notice that there are pets here, dogs and cats. So we, we sort of have this subtle message here that these people are not going to get along. Also, he, he flips it. It's oh, the white cat with the black family, the black dog with the, with the white kids. But we think of dogs and cats fighting, certainly. And, um, and the reticence, the curiosity here would suggest that maybe this group isn't going to get along. But Norman Rockwell includes an important detail here, two important details, the baseball gloves. Oh, and this boy's wearing a baseball uniform. So you know in the next two seconds, they're gonna be on the lawn playing catch, which is like such a great way to connect with people, isn't it? And, but this is that moment, that pregnant moment where you're assessing somebody who's different from you and you don't know what to make of it. Um, we experience this all the time with people who are different from us in whatever way. He's captured this so perfectly and suggested that there are, there are points of connection for all of us. Incidentally, the way he uses color here is just so wonderful, from the yellow in the sweater to the car to the chair over here. If you have really good eyes, you can even see that there's a little nosy neighbor peeking out the window over here, sort of wondering how this is all going to unfold. Here is Norman Rockwell uh, working with these models, even the dog, <laughs> to, uh, to get these poses just exactly right. So what makes this picture so good? Um, I think if we look back to those bigger ideas, inclusion, exclusion, this is a, a powerful way of showing a story that's about inclusion. It's a story about the American middle class. It's a story about a, a universal experience, just like, you know, going off to the beach for the day and having, um, you know, leaving with all that energy, coming home exhausted. Norman Rockwell is trying to tell the story of integration and the promise of integration through, um, through the narrative of these children here. Here he is with the finished painting. Norman Rockwell was seven years old when he painted this, and I think he is feeling pretty radical at this point in his life. One of the last images that I wanted to share with you is this picture that he painted for Look Magazine called The Right to Know. This is from 1968. It was part of a big article about um, Vietnam and, um, and racial equality. And so it's a, it's a diverse cross-section of the American public essentially confronting their government. And it's a really powerful image. This is not the kind of Norman Rockwell painting that most people think of when they think of Norman Rockwell. But look at this. He included himself in this populace. And he's actually hanging out with the hippies over here. So I think it gives us a sense in terms of how he was feeling about the state of the country at this point. So we'll wrap up with the final word and, and sort of how things ended with, Norman, with the end of Norman Rockwell's life. 
1976, he was asked to paint the, um, the July 4th cover of American Artist Magazine. This is just a few years before his death. His ability to paint that exquisite detail that he had always captured in all his paintings was, fade, was fading. But we can see his sense of patriotism here. He's depicted himself alongside an American icon, the Liberty Bell. But this is a very smart selection on his choice because the Liberty Bell is broken, it's flawed, but it's something that he still loves and he's going to celebrate. And I think that really um, is like an apt comparison for how he felt about the country at this point. Um, the following year, he wins the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Gerald Ford. This is him with the award back in his studio. And he passes away in 1978. You can see in February 1979, the Saturday Evening Post loves Norman Rockwell again. He is their golden boy. So, um, so we'll just the last few images I wanted to share with you are just ways that artists today are sort of um, engaging with Norman Rockwell's imagery in new ways to talk about diversity in America. This is a mural in New Orleans where we can see. It's the new kids on the block, but the roles have been reversed. Uh, white kids moving into a predominantly black neighborhood. The artist Maggie Miners has done a lot of work to reinterpret uh, Norman Rockwell's uh, paintings with photography and with more diverse casts. So we have the four freedoms being reintroduced here. In this case, you know, there's a gay couple serving the, the, the food. Um, we see uh, more diverse religions being represented. And then I think that this is a really poignant image, um, a Black woman tucking in her Black boys to bed for freedom from fear. She also reinterpreted the problem we all live with um, uh, as a problem, uh, as the modern day problem at the border patrol. Um, this was done in 2015. Uh, it was actually supposed to be a, a reference to the, uh, uh, the DACA pro program. So other artists too, uh, photographers, uh, Hank Willis Thomas and Evelyn Scher have used hundreds of actors and models to reinterpret Norman Rockwell's uh, For Freedom. This is Rosario da Dawson reinterpreting the freedom of speech. Here are a few reinterpretations of the freedom of religion. I, I just love this one over here. And then uh, freedom from want. Um, on, uh, uh, on, on these slides here. So again, a much more diverse family being represented uh, by those artists. So the very last note I think that's important to hit is that if Norman Rockwell were alive today, I think he would love those reinterpretations of his paintings um, because I think that was really his goal, his desire with his work sort of all along the way. So I think you'd be really pleased to know that his work was still being valued, reassessed, and reinterpreted in this way, um, uh, in a way that certainly aligned with his feelings and um, positions around race in America. So I'll end there for now. And if anybody has any questions or comments, I'd be happy to hear them.